Elon, Hello. welcome. Hi. Uh, you in Palo Alto, I understand? Yeah, I'm, I'm at uh, well, uh, Global Engineering Headquarters in Palo Alto. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm actually going to start somewhere a little bit differently than I expected, um, because I just saw on, oh. twi on Twitter <laughs> um, a little announcement. Um, I would love to get your, th your thoughts on it. Uh, I see you're uh, interviewing Ron DeSantis tomorrow morning. Is that right, on Twitter Spaces? I see. Um, yes, it's, uh, I need to look at the exact time, but or tomorrow morning, your time, I think it would be probably correct. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, I um, will be interviewing um, Ron DeSantis, and he has uh, quite an announcement to make. Um, and will be, be the first time that something like this is happening on social media and with uh, real time questions and answers. Uh, not, not scripted, uh, so it's going to be live and let 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 her up. Let's see what happens. And um, and you've been tweeting some Tim Scott stuff in the last few days. Um, yeah. What should we be thinking about? Uh, who you're backing? Obviously, this interview tells us something. Can you give us a sense of where where your thinking is at the moment? Yes, I mean I'm, I'm not at this time um, planning to endorse uh, any particular candidate. Um, but I am uh, interested in uh, you know, X slash Twitter being somewhat of a public town square and uh, where more and more organizations host content and make announcements on Twitter. Um, it's, the, it's the only place on the internet to really get uh, real time, like down to the minute and second news. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's quite groundbreaking that there'd be, um, a major announcement uh, of this type on social media. Um, and should we expect, um, sorry, I don't want to go on too long about this, but um, in your new role as interviewer rather than interviewee, uh, should, we expect, <laughs> um, uh, should we expect more of this? I mean, if it's the town square, are you going to be interviewing other candidates, Democrats? What's your, what's your thought of this? Are people willing to come? Are you going to be there to yes. execute the town square across the spectrum? Yes, absolutely. Um, so just as I, as I promised when I do a series of media, media interviews, I did a range of interviews. Um, and uh, I guess this would be also <laughs> a media interview. Um, so ranging from sort of on, on the you know, left, moderate to what's considered right. Um, and I do think it's important that Twitter be, uh, have both the reality and the perception of a uh, level playing field of uh, a place where uh, all voices are heard and where uh, there's the kind of dynamic in uh, interaction that is you don't really see anywhere else. Um, I mean, today on Twitter, for example, um, uh, uh, AOC got into an, uh, and, and uh, Ted Cruz got into an argument on Twitter, which was um, yeah, it, independent of which side you agree with, um, it's still very entertaining. <laughs> so what, um, and I'm sure tomorrow will be entertaining, we're all going to be we tuned into that, but um, when, you, when you approach an interview like that, and, and obviously a, a really important election like the one that is coming up, you, yeah. can you just talk a little bit about what are the key issues that really matter for you at this pivotal moment? Do you mean matter for me as an individual or? Matter for or you as an individual um, in terms of who leads the country. But also, right. you know, more broadly than that, you know, for, for the country and for, for your businesses. I mean, can you give your sense of, of where the real issues lie here? Well, I've said publicly that um, my preference, and I think would be the preference of most Americans, is really to have someone fairly normal in office. Um, <laughs> someone, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we'd all be quite, uh, quite happy with that, actually. Um, you know, I think someone that uh, is representative of the moderate views that I think most of the country holds in reality. Um, and, um, but, but the way things are set up is that we, we, we do have a system that seems to push things towards the edges because of the primaries. So in order to win the primary, you've got to win, um, obviously, a majority of your party's vote. Uh, in both cases, that tends to cause a swing to the left and the right. Uh, although I think things are more complex than simply left and right, mm -hmm. uh, during the primaries, and then, uh, and then a shift towards the center for the general election. Um, 
as for uh, what, what I think is, yeah, so, so I, I would really just like someone, you know, fairly normal and sensible to be uh, the president, that would be great. So if we, go um. through the, <laughs> if we go through the four names in the frame at the moment, can you just give a sort of yes, no, and whether they're normal and sensible? Um, <laughs> so um, we've got Joe Biden. I, I mean, I think I, I, think, I, think <laughs> I need to, you know, be careful about these statements. Um, so I, uh, we'd maybe have to have a few drinks before I would give you the answers to all of them. Uh, <laughs> and, well, and then I'd be I will, um, I will look forward to that, and I look forward to the, uh, to the conversation tomorrow, and, and obviously a lot more of those to come over the coming months. So um, yeah. that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so what I wanted to start with, you've just flown in, I think, in the last 20 minutes. Um, you live a pretty yeah. hectic lifestyle. Um, but you've said that the only true currency is time. Can you give a sense to the people in this room who are scheduled within... Uh, an inch of their lives, sort of how you, you know, what is a day in the life of Elon Musk? What does that look like? Well, my days are very long and complicated, as you might imagine. Yeah. Um, and um, and there's, great, there's a great deal of context switching. So um, there's a meme I like called like relating to doom where it's like fear is not the mind killer, context switching is. Uh, so switching context is, is quite painful, but um, I do generally try to divide a company so it's predominantly one company on one day. So today is a Tesla day, for example. Um, although I might end up at Twitter late tonight. Um, and then tomorrow would be partly a Tesla day as well, part, uh, but, but sort of half Twitter. Um, and, um, and, then, and then Thursday would be sort of a half SpaceX, half Tesla day. But th th these things are somewhat intertwined. So, the time management is extremely difficult. Um, and this is going to sound pretty strange, but I, um, I only have one uh, part-time assistant. Um, How many days so, a week is that, the part-time? Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose in terms of hours she works, it would technically be full-time, but it's not. <laughs> um, I, I do most of the scheduling uh, myself. Um, and the re reason I do that is because it's impossible for someone else to know what the priorities are. Um, so, the, and since the most valuable thing I have is time, I schedule it myself, for the most part. So, if you come into Tesla today, do you have a series of meetings uh, set up? Yeah. Or do you um, come in with, you know, something on your mind and you go in and see people? I mean, how structured is this? Or if you show up at Twitter, in terms of the people working for you, how do they, how do they handle that? Um, yeah, so, so today I have several hours of scheduled meetings at Twitter. Um, so there are a number of, of things that operate on a weekly cadence. Um, and so th those meetings are, are already set up. And then I have supplemental meetings at the end of the day. Um, but to be clear, I, 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 I won't be going to sleep until probably 2 a.m. or something like that. I'll be working almost the entire time. And if you're scheduling this yourself, is AI going to be helpful over the next few years to help you um, do this? Are you going to be using technology to help you manage that? I guess we'll all be using technology. I don't use a lot of AI myself day to day. I mean, Tesla AI is actually very advanced for real world AI. It's the most advanced real real world AI um, by far. Um, and in fact, if, I, if, if positions were swapped and it was say up to Microsoft and OpenAI to create uh, who could create the best large language model. And if basically, if the tasks were swapped, Tesla was given the, the, the task of making the most competitive large language model, and Microsoft OpenAI were tasked with self-driving, Tesla would win. Okay. I don't think people understand the degree of the, the, the capability of Tesla's AI system. So while I don't use AI a lot, personally, uh, Tesla uses a, lot, a tremendous amount. But we'll, um, we'll, we'll get onto that in a second, if that's okay. But one final thing in terms of just the management of, of what you do with your life. You're running three very big companies. You have very big stakes and you know, ownership control of, of, of two of those, at least. Um, what is your succession plan if you suddenly can't execute what you're doing, both in terms of who runs the companies, but as importantly, who votes those shares in terms of um, you know, what happens longer term and strategically. What, 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 have you got a plan for all of those? 
Yeah, um, succession is one of the toughest age-old problems. Um, you know, it's it's a uh, it's plagued um, you know countries, kings, prime ministers, and presidents for and CEOs for for you know since the dawn of history. Um, there is no obvious solution. I, I mean, there, there are particular individuals identified as that, that I've told forward, look, if something happens to me unexpectedly, this is who my, this is my recommendation for taking over. So in all cases, the board is aware of, of who, who my recommendation is, which they may choose to, it's, it's mm -hmm. up to them, of course. They, they may choose to go a different direction, but I, they, there is a, in, in the worst case scenario, this is who should run the company. Uh, the control question is a much more is a much tougher question, um, and something that I'm wrestling with, and I'm frankly open to ideas because it certainly is true that the companies that I have created and are creating um, collectively possess uh, immense capability, um, and so the stewardship of them is incredibly important. Um, I want to make sure that the stewardship is ultimately. Uh, accrues the benefit of humanity. That's the idea, is the furtherance of civilization. Um, not, that, not that we're always successful in that, but that is aspirationally our goal. Um, so um, I, I have, I have one, one idea, which is sort of partly in place, which is to create kind of a, an, an, a, a sort of an educational institution that, that would control um, most of my vote, um, but, but but this is this is not a case of um, automatically. I, I'm definitely not not of the school of automatically giving my kids uh, a you know some share of the companies, even if they are not, even if they have no interest or inclination, you know, or ability to to manage the companies. I think that's a mistake. Um, so, but but it, it's a very hard problem to solve. I, so, and then, and then who should be on the board of directors of the ed educational institution is also a very, very hard job to solve. Um, so I think probably some disaggregation of control would make sense. Uh, I'm, I'm really just kind of thinking out loud creatively here. But it sounds um, like it's something that you, I mean, you need to get planning of who those people are gonna be because as you've said, whether, when you look at SpaceX, you look at Tesla, you look at Twitter, these, these matter to society a lot yeah. and having the right people to take those votes on the future of where they go and where money gets spent is is fairly important um, yes absolutely now the goals of the companies their the achievement of those goals varies considerably in difficulty um, you know the, the the original goal of tesla was to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy which actually i think we've we've done done that to a significant degree um, and have actually it's kind of of uh, it's kind, it's kind of uh, uh, auto industry CEOs to often acknowledge uh, Tesla's role in accelerating electric vehicles, um, and um, you know, so so that so that that, that I feel has a lot of momentum. Um, they're still solving self-driving, which we're you know aspirationally hoping to do this year, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and so so Tesla's got got a long way to go, but but the execution plan is relatively clear. Um, and uh, that, ex that execution plan will generate a lot of positive cash flow for the company. So it's like a, it's a fairly obvious thing to do. With SpaceX, it's a harder problem because uh, the long-term objective is to make life multiplanetary with a self-sustaining city on Mars, which is likely to be very cash flow negative uh, at first. And it's very much like a long-term. Let's just say the target market on Mars is small. Uh, <laughs> You got to think long term here. You're also going to um, have to get on very well with those you go with, I would imagine. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, you, you know, you, you, sanity will be a prime requirement for uh, and stability for, for traveling to Mars. You don't want someone going nuts and opening the airlock in the middle of the night. Um, right. So, so anyway, so, so SpaceX is a harder problem because it's it's uh, much a long term goal and and with uh, a lot more money lost along the way. So got to make sure that that happens. Um, and is that and the sort of thing, just to stay on SpaceX, and we'll go to Twitter and Tesla in a second, but um, is that the sort of thing that you'd like to lock in to the goals of SpaceX, that Mars remains the ultimate um, ambition of this?
come what may. Is that is that that important to you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's to make life multi multiplanetary such that, um, and, and the the key threshold for multiplanetary is that if the supply ships from Earth stop coming for any reason, that uh, Mars does not die out. That's the that's the that's the critical great filter. If you talk about things in terms of the Fermi paradox, the great filter is. Um, Mars being self-sustaining without any resupply shifts from Earth. Uh, until we reach that point, we're really just a one planet civilization with uh, an extension. Um, but at the point at which the, the, the planets are self-sustaining, or Mars is self-sustaining, then even in a worst case scenario uh, of, of, of Earth civilization either dying with a bang or a whimper, um, then, then Mars would have a much better chance of surviving. Um, so the intent here overall is to ensure that the light of consciousness, which appears to be just a tiny candle in a vast darkness. Um, I, I, frequently, I frequently get asked, have I seen any evidence of aliens? And I, I have not. <laughs> um, you know, apart from the fact that I did at one point have an alien registration card when I was getting my uh, green, green, green card uh, to alien registration. Indeed. Possibly a slightly <laughs> different type of alien. But um, so do you think you'll, will you live to see Mars happen? I, I hope to live to see the first humans on Mars. Right. Um, but I think it will take some period of time beyond that to make Mars self-sustaining. So it's at least 20 years from the first visit to make Mars sustaining is my guess. And it may be 40 or 50. And that's assuming you really go for it. Right. So. That's a tough one, um, but uh, like I said, I think important for um, improving the survivability of civilization. And who's going to pay for that? I mean, are your investors going to put the money up to do that? Are you going to expect government to fund that? Where, where, where does that money come from? Because you, as you say, you can make a return on Starlink, you can make a return on launching satellites for other people and space tourism, but I mean, that's a, that's a tougher return, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think long term, uh, the value of it will be incredibly high. I would just, it's just beyond the planning horizon of, of right. most people or most investors. So, um, I mean, obviously, if, if, um, if there's a thriving um, city on Mars and there's a lot of inter interplanetary commerce and SpaceX is the primary provider of that, it would be immensely valuable. Um, so, um, but, but, you know, the important thing is that, th that there be this self-sustaining uh, okay. you know, colony. Um, and um, I think we, 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 I think we uh, generally operate with too much of an assumption that civilization is robust um, and nothing could really take it down. Uh, a, a sentiment that has been common throughout history among empires shortly before they crumbled. <laughs> so, and you know, I have to say, that, you know, there's, there's a little bit of late stage empire vibes going on right now. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> are you, um, are you, yeah. Um, uh, is, is AI something that, in your view, accelerates the risk of that or in increases the risk of that, at that outcome? I think it does, yeah. Um, I mean, we could definitely make. A city of Mars is self-sustaining without without AI, or without sort of AGI, which is generally artificial general intelligence or super intelligence. Uh, so I think uh, that that is uh, it's not necessary for anything we're doing, um, but it is happening and happening very quickly. So uh, there is a risk that uh, advanced AI um, either uh, eliminates or constrains humanity's growth. I was more thinking the opposite. Does it increase the chance that plant, the planet self implodes and those things come true? Are you, I mean, how concerned are you about these developments right now, sort of accelerating your, your bad case scenario here? Well, uh, I mean, the development of artificial digital sort of super intelligence uh, is very much a double edged sword. So it's, if, you if you have a genie that can grant you anything, that can also do anything. Um, that necessarily is presents a danger. Um, 
And I expect the first uses of AI to be, um, or certainly the first government uses of AI to be web, weapons technology. So just having um, more advanced weapons on the battlefield that can, that can react uh, faster than any human could. Uh, that's, that's really what AI will be capable of. Um, I mean, future wars between countries, advanced countries, or at least countries that have significant drone capability will be very much the drone wars. So I want to get back to AI because this is this is big stuff, and I'd like to to talk about it in more detail. But I do want to come just come back to the present from a long way in the future. Um, you just hired a new CEO, uh, Linda Linda Yaccarino, um, an ad veteran um, into Twitter. You, you usually focus on hiring engineers. You know, Linda is a very different person. Can you just quickly tell us about your courtship? How did that go down? Well. <clears throat> um... We, we had conversations over a number of months uh, just relating to advertising. Um, and then uh, Linda felt that um, it would be very helpful for the advertisers to see me in person, so invited me down to a conference in Miami, um, which was very helpful, um, and met with a number of advertisers personally to assure, their, you know, assure them that, that Twitter is uh, a good place to advertise. And, um, and generally, that, in fact, that that hate speech has declined, which it has, um, and that the quality of the system, um, with res especially with respect to scammers and spammers, is dramatically better than it used to be. Um, we've, we've gotten rid of, at this point, well over 90% of the, the scams and scams, on, the, the scams and spam on, on Twitter. So it should be quite rare at this point that you see a scam. Um, so um, we've also rolled out uh, sort of freedom so of Just speech. to be clear, when you say you've got rid of 90% of the scams, is, but yeah. does, is that the same thing as the bots, or is this scams in general, and bots is a different animal here? There, there were typically use bots for scamming. Yeah. So but you haven't have... taken the bots down 90%? No, I think we, we have, actually. You think you have? Okay. Yeah, uh, I think we have, yeah. But maybe more than 19 90% at least. Um, it is now much, much harder to operate a bot bomb on Twitter and have it uh, yield any, any uh, advantage. Um, so, uh, dramatic improvement in bots, um, dramatic improvement in ability to, to detect uh, sort of troll armies, which is a little different. That's where you've got, say, oh, uh, you know, a um, hundred people in a warehouse uh, in a, in a low-wage country, each, each of which are sitting at a desk with a hundred phones. So you've got 10,000 actual people, mm. um, and they will then act co uh, together uh, to brigade a particular subject. Uh, or make something seem very popular when it is not. Um, and we've been able to defeat almost all of them. We, we think very few of them are actually still able to, to, to operate. So, anyway, so the quality of the system has gotten a lot better. OK. So um, if you said to Linda that you are going to keep speaking your mind, whatever the commercial impact of that. And has she agreed to that? Is she happy with that? You aligned? Uh, yeah. OK. And in her role as CEO, does she have any say over moderation, or is that under you, or you, do you do that together? Well, the, the general principle is that um, um, we, will, we will hew close to the law. So for any given country, um, we will try to adhere as closely to the law as possible. Our law is varied between countries, and we can't simply flat the law in, 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 um, in another country because they will simply cut us off. Um, so, but the general principle is do whatever we can to um, enable free and open communications with, between people, um, provided they're not, like I said, breaking and the law. And she's aligned on, on that. That plan, yeah. that focus. Um, uh, yeah, there, there is an important thing, which is like that, that obviously doesn't mean that, say, advertisers uh, should be forced to appear next to any content. So we, we've also developed adjacency controls that ensure that if what you're advertising is, um, like Disney, Disney, for example, is a big advertiser. Um, if Disney is advertising a children's movie, they, you know, it want the, the content nearby to be sort of, family-friendly. That's totally understandable. 
Um, so uh, so it's, it's, it's not like advertisers have to appear next to content that they, that they don't agree with. And can um, you, um, so some people would say you're, you can be a little erratic with your tweeting or, or at least um, tweet a broad range of, of content. Um, does anybody say I don't want to be adjacent to Elon Musk? Is that, is that something that's happened on the, on the platform? I've never heard that yet, um, okay. but uh, <laughs> um, nope, never heard that, that. even okay. directly. And, directly. and, and did, it, did, Lin, did that come up with Linda at all, sort of what you tweet and, and whether that was something that could affect advertisers? Did she, did she ask you about that? Uh, she did, in fact, at the conference that we did right. in Miami, okay. and I said free speech is paramount. Fine. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your vision for, for Twitter as a, as a community and as a, as a conversation. Um, you've talked about your desire to maximize unregretted time. Can you, yes. just, can you explain what that means and how you measure that? Uh, yeah, so uh, previously Twitter was mostly uh, focused on this number called, uh, they called MDAO, Monetizable Daily Active Users. Um, but the problem is that uh, when you look closely at that, um, a bunch of those users um, never even went to Twitter. They would go to, um, uh, you know, they would see a notification on their phone um, about a tweet, but they wouldn't actually click through the site. Right. So what, what really matters is uh, true user seconds of screen time. Um, so that's, that's the figure we track right now. Um, and that's based on the, the, the screen time as reported to us by uh, uh, the, uh, iOS, Android, and the, the, the browser. So um, it would be, it would have to, uh, the time, the, the amount of time the app is in the foreground. Right. Which I think is, is the most rigorous way to assess this. Um, so, so when you say unregretted, sorry, please keep going. Exactly. So in, in terms of unregretted, it's, that, that's a little harder to measure. Um, but we can certainly gather it anecdotally, which is to say that if you spent you know, half an hour on Twitter yesterday, what percentage of, the, percentage of that time do you regret? Um, and generally the feedback I've gotten has been very positive, uh, that they, they find it, the information to be useful, entertaining, funny. Um, so we seem to be heading in the right direction as far as I can tell. I'm certainly open to any critiques from the room. Well, let me, let me ask you one on that, which is, um, you know, you recently tweeted about George Soros, you said, um, let me get that. Uh, uh, well, let me just get the words, because I'm kind of interested in what you think about this. He wants to erode the very fabric of civilization. Soros hates humanity. That obviously generated a huge amount of response on Twitter on both sides, lots of different viewpoints. Is that yeah. unregrettable time, unregretted time? That, that debate that you created, does that fit into that category, do you think? Well, I mean, I said, like, Soros reminds me of Magneto, you know. Uh, so. Well, you, you know, then went the, a little further than that. But I'm do, again, yeah, without yeah. going into the Soros tweet itself, you know, you, you're a, obviously a big figure on Twitter and you're setting a tone and a, an aim. So I'm just curious as to whether that sort of debate, which, which gets triggered, is that, does that fit into the definition that you're trying to create in that new town square? Well, I mean, I think the important thing is that, like, look, what I say is not, uh, is, is what I say. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a town square. I'm not going to mitigate what I say because that would be inhibiting freedom of speech. That doesn't mean you have to agree with what I say. Nor does it mean if somebody says the total opposite that, they're, that they won't be supported on Twitter. They are. Um, the point is to have a divergent set of views. And free speech is only relevant um, if it's a speech by, if, if speech by someone you don't like, who says something you don't like, is that allowed? If, if so, you have free speech, otherwise you do not. And for those who would advocate censorship, I would say it is, if, if, if you succeed in that, it's only a matter of time before the censorship gets turned on you. I agree. I mean, you can, that's your free speech definition, which you said, but I'm just curious as to, on the unregrettable part, what, what, what type of conversation you're trying to achieve and whether that's something that is acceptable, but maybe not where you want the broader conversation to go. Well, I mean, I did clarify that, you know, some of my concerns about Soros are that he has funded um, a very large number of uh, small but influential races around the country, especially with district, district attorneys. Um, you know, he funded, the, for example, the LA and, uh, and, and San Francisco district attorney races. Uh, um, 
uh, with uh, Chess Bodine and um, the guy who always, I always want to call him uh, Gaston from uh, Beard and the Beast, but I think it's Gaston. Um, um, and and the, the, he's basically, he's, he's, he's um, caused a, a large number of DAs to be elected who are uh, very easy on crime um, and will often refuse, refuse to, to uh, prosecute. Uh, so so you were basically them. trying to make a, a deeper point with that short? Yes. Okay. Um, can I just move on quickly to, because um, I, I don't want to go too far down that, that rabbit hole, because that debate has played out on Twitter a, a bit, is, um, you know, are you back near profitability now? Twitter is not quite there, but we, we're, we're, we're not like, you know, when I, when I first, when acquisition closed, I'd say it, it, it's analogous to being teleported into a plane that's plunging to the ground with its engines on fire and the controls don't work. Um, so it's comforting, to say the least. Um, now, we had to do some pretty heavy-handed uh, right. cost-cutting if the company healthy, but we're, at this point, we're trending towards, if we get lucky, we might be cash flow, cash, cash flow positive next month, um, but it remains to be seen. And is, is the staffing the level you now want it, or are you going to start taking it back up again from this? It's gone from, I think, 8,000 to about 1,500 or something like that. Is that correct? Uh, that's roughly correct, yeah. Um, I think there's, you know, there's, um, there's definitely, we are going to start adding people to the company, um, and we have started adding some number of people to the company. Um, and, um, but it's, it's still, there's still a lot of change to, ha to happen, so... But I, I think 1,500 is probably a, a reasonable number. And does this show what you can do um, in a big tech company in terms of cost reduction? I mean, when you look around other big tech companies in uh, Silicon Valley, um, would you say from your experience that there's room for much more significant change at those as well? Yeah, I think Twitter may be somewhat of an outlier in that um, th th there were a lot of people doing things that, that didn't seem to have a lot of value. Um, and that's, I think that's true probably at most Silicon Valley companies. Um, maybe not to the degree to which it was at Twitter, but uh, it's still, yeah. <laughs> There's a potential for significant cuts, I think, at other companies without affecting their productivity, in fact, increasing their productivity. Um, so, you know, um, in any given company, there are people who help move things forward and, and people who sort of try to slam the brakes on. And Twitter was in a situation where you'd have a meeting of 10 people, you know, and, and one person with an accelerator and nine, nine with a set of brakes. Um, so you didn't go very far. Right. Um, and um, so now, now, now we're, we're gung-ho about releasing functionality, even if with, at a little bit of risk to site stability, so long as it's not too serious. Um, and I think at this point, it's probably fair to say we've uh, introduced more functionality in the last uh, six months than Twitter has in the last six years. And in terms of outages, there were some outages early on. Are you, are you confident things are stable now? Well, outages are not unusual. Instagram recently had an outage, for example. It was reported on Twitter, <laughs> ironically. Um, so uh, we've had outages, but not, not massive ones. And they've generally been brief and limited in scope. Okay. Um, do you regret buying it? You tried to get out of it, or are you now happy you bought it? Well, all's well that ends well. <laughs> we'll see has, it, has it ended well yet, or we still got to wait and see? Um, I think we're on the, hopefully, on the uh, comeback arc. Okay. So, you, I mean, one of the things you have talked about, you bought it for $44 billion. You've talked about it one day being worth 250 I think, in internal meetings. Can you just talk about how you get there? What is the, what is the bigger vision? I mean, you want to bring back advertisers now. And, and are they coming back, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you give any idea of the scale of the comeback in terms of who you lost and who's coming back? Uh, well, I think it'll be very significant. Um, so the advertising agencies at this point have all um, lifted their warnings on Twitter. Um, so appreciate the fact that that Group M, for example, um, remove the sort of uh, con their concern label over Twitter, which is a very big deal. Um, 
And so I, th I think at this point, uh, I, I expect almost all advertisers to return. Okay. Um, we've also uh, done a lot more to make the advertising uh, more relevant to users, um, so that we show users things that are they're more likely to be interested in buying. Sounds obvious, but right. That's what tends to happen. Yeah. Sounds um, super obvious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, just just basic stuff like if you do a search on Twitter. Previously, the the search banner ad um, did, did, not, did not take the search terms into account, which is pretty insane. Um, so just show a random ad, okay. whereas obviously show an ad that is, you know, matches well, your search. Sounds search. sounds worth doing. So so just quickly, what is you've talked about the sort of single app that that does messaging and does finance and other yeah. things. I mean, can you just enlarge a little bit on sort of how you get there and and why America wants that? Well, obviously, it'd be up to people to decide if they want it. Um, it's like, do we make something that is useful enough um, that you want to use it more frequently? Um, great, that, that's our goal. Um, so we're, we're not going to do anything to, to stop people leaving the app or try to trap them in the app, but just provide enough compelling functionality that over time, uh, people's usage of the platform grows. So in 10 years' time, is advertising still going to be dominant on Twitter? I think advertising will always play a role. Um, at some point, say 10 years from now, it may not play the largest role, but it will play the largest role for at least a few years to come. So I want to do a quick, um, quick far round of questions. Just you know, imagine that you're late at night, you're sitting there tweeting a few rapid fire responses to stuff. Um, and I'm just going to ask you a few questions, and if you can just give me short answers, and then I want to go on to AI and talk a little bit about some of the deeper points that you, you started making earlier. Um, so first one, will Twitter be public again in five years? I don't know. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, do you think the HQ will still be in San Francisco? Answer. OK, not good so far. Let's try a couple more. Um, which decade are we going to crack artificial general intelligence? I think this one. This one, OK. So it's that soon, OK. Um, are you going to take a SpaceX trip yourself? I will at some point, yeah. Not sure when, but Not sure when. it'll be nice. Um, which is the most exciting country to build a Tesla plant in right now? <laughs> um, well, we, we did make an announcement that Mexico would be our next uh, location outside the US. Uh, and picked a site and everything. So there's that. And then um, we'll, we'll pro probably pick another location towards the end of this year. Is India interesting? Absolutely. OK. Um, are you still a fan of crypto? Um, well, I mean, I'm not advising anyone to buy a crypto or bet the farm on you know, Dogecoin or anything like that. Okay. Don't bet on Dogecoin. <laughs> you might have been thinking. Maybe you should, but let me advise you. That would be a, perhaps unwise. Um, okay. So, I, Dogecoin is my is my sort of favorite cryptocurrency because uh, it has the best humor and uh, has dogs. Um, um, I did, however, look at the price of it yesterday. It's um, it's lower than it was, I think. Well, I don't know. Maybe you know. You know it's like. A friend of mine has a saying that the most ironic explanation is the most likely. And the most ironic outcome for currency would be that the thing that was made at, uh, as, a, as a joke to make fun of cryptocurrencies, uh, the most ironic outcome would become that it becomes the global currency. OK, we'll wait and see. Final one, um, can you rank the US and China on their development of AI each out of 10? Um, I mean, the U.S. Has, very much has the uh, most advanced AI. So this is, you see, like, I, like China's close behind, certainly, and has the resources to scale and to optimize. Um, the, the, the biggest single advances in AI still come from the U.S. and Europe. Um, but... Um, all right, so it's hard to give an exact number of score. It's more like... But there's a I big gap the, still. There, there is a, there's a gap. Um, that gap looks like it's on the order of 12 months. Right. 
fish. Right. And narrowing or expanding? It's hard to tell. I suspect it will narrow right. to some degree. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you've created a new AI company yourself. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of energy and activity in this space, or at least yeah. it's been talked about. I mean, what do you want to do yourself in this space beyond Tesla and, and the, the stuff you talked about earlier? It, what, what is that new thing? Well, I think there should be a significant third horse in the race here. Uh, we've got OpenAI and Microsoft, Google DeepMind, and probably there should be a third horse in the race. Um, so we'll be more on that soon. But is it something that will interact with the data of Twitter and the capability of Tesla? Is it something that tries to bring what you've talked about earlier in terms of capability together and become that third player? Is that what you're talking about? To some degree, I don't want to jump the gun here on, on announcements, but the, um, you know, the OpenAI has a relationship with Microsoft that seems to work very well, fairly well. So it's possible that um, XAI and Twitter and Tesla would have something similar. Possible. Um, uh, you've talked about the importance of regulation, and you called for this this moratorium. I mean. The history of regulating tech has been checkered. It's been very hard for regulators to keep up with tech, let alone get ahead of it. What do you think actually needs to happen that practically could in this space to, to try to change that? Because obviously the history of this is not encouraging. Yeah, I mean, I think there should be, you know, I've been pushing hard for a long time. I met with a number of um, senior set, uh, senators in Congress, people in Congress and the White House uh, to advocate for AI regulation, uh, starting with uh, a, an insight committee that is formed of independent parties as well as perhaps participants from the, the leaders uh, in industry. And that uh, that, that oversight committee uh, gains, um, or I should say get, that insight committee gains insight into what various companies are up to. Um, and uh, you know, to the degree that there's competitive dynamics there, you can obviously, um, you, you would um, sequester board members who are perhaps have conflicts. Uh, but anyway, you, you figure out some sort of regulatory board and, uh, and they, they start off gaining insight and then uh, have proposed rulemaking. Um, and then that, you know, we'll get commented on by industry and, uh, and then hopefully we have some sort of oversight rules that improve uh, safety just as we do with uh, aircraft with the FAA uh, and spacecraft um, and uh, cars with NHTSA and uh, food and drugs with the Food and Drug Administration. Right. And how would that work in such a global thing as we're talking about where AI and the relative uh, advance between countries is going to be very, very important? Uh, is that something that is, is globalizable? Is that, is that? Well, really, the key question is, uh, will China uh, you know, cooperate with the West. Um, that remains to be seen. Um, but I, I would still advocate like some degree of, of, of oversight. I mean, we have a regulatory oversight of aircraft, for example, and yet the, the US is still very much uh, doing great on the aircraft front. Right. So it makes more aircraft than the rest of, than any, in any other place. Um, so just because you have you know, FAA regulation doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's necessarily slowed down very much. Okay. Um, does, so, so, so your view would be that the AI changes today lock in the tech giants, the Microsofts and the Googles of this world. Does it also, is there also a scenario where it actually helps to um, bring in new players and, 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 and change that dynamic or is that a much more unlikely outcome? Well, there are um, a lot of AI startups. Um, the thing that's becoming tricky is that in order of, you really need three things um, to compete. You need uh, talent, talented people. Um, you need um, a lot of compute, expensive compute, and you need access to data. So whoever's got, whoever's succeeding on those three will win. Um, 
so now, now that the, the cost of compute has gotten astronomical. Um, so it's, it's now, you know, kind of sort of minimum ante, I would say, uh, minimum would be $250 million of server hardware. Minimum. That's like just to right. relevant in any way. So the startups are more likely to piggyback off what the others are doing rather than compete directly themselves, is what you're saying. <clears throat> yeah, to train, to train a big model. Um, are you going to take a SpaceX trip yourself? To, to train a model of, of probably GPT-5 size, I wouldn't be surprised if they use at least 30,000, 30, maybe 50,000 H100s, which are the latest mm -hmm. uh, GPUs. Are not sure. It's not quite the right word, but the latest technology from NVIDIA. Um, so, and then you need to run inference as well. Um, so, it's a lot of the, 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 the GPUs are, at um, this point, considerably harder to get than drugs. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's, that's not really not a high bar in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> you can tell us more about that later, but yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, a um, couple of things I just wanted to go into on, on AI, which I'd love your perspective on. Um, is this going to, what does it mean for society in terms of, is this going to embed wealth and power in a very small subset and create a, a big widening of inequality? Is it going to democratize and create the opposite? What, what is your sense of, of where this heads? In terms of um, access to goods and services, I think AI will be ushering an age of abundance. Assuming that we're in a benign AI scenario, um, I think the AI will be able to make goods and services um, very inexpensively. Um, and so in anything that is a product or a service where there's not artificial uh, scarcity created, um, such as like, I want to live exactly in, in this, you know, neighborhood of houses. It's like, okay, well, there's only hundred houses there. So, you know, that, that would still have scarcity, um, or a unique artwork would have scarcity, but anything that does not have scarcity that we, def that we deliberately designed to be scarce will be plentiful for everyone in a benign scenario. And in the unbenign scenario? Huh. Well, there's a wide range of... But what's the thing that you're most worried about? When you look at, you know, when you've been talking for years about the need for regulation, what is the scenario that really keeps you up at night? Well, I don't, th I don't think the AI is going to try to destroy all humanity, but it might put us under strict controls. Um, I mean, and there's no non-zero chance of, of it going Terminator. It's not zero percent, but it's it's. I think it's a it's a small likelihood of of annihilating humanity, but it's not zero. We want that probably to be as zero as close to zero as possible. Um, and and then, like I said, the uh, of AI assuming control for the safety of all the humans and taking over all the, all the computing systems and weapon systems of Earth. And effectively being like some sort of uber nanny. But isn't isn't another scenario? <laughs> if, you say, if, if you say if you say that yeah, like well, you know, like let 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 let's say you're, you're uh, you know a Miss World, Miss World contest, contest, contestant, <laughs> hypothetically. Um, it's unlikely. <laughs> let's face it. But, um, uh, and 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 you know you say what what do you want? And it's, it's I want world peace. Um, and uh, it's like okay, well the. You know, one way to achieve world peace is to take all the weapons away from the humans so they can no longer use them uh, and, and to punish any humans that engage in um, you know, extraterritorial act activity. But isn't the, more, isn't the more likely nasty outcome that rather than AI taking over and being the ultimate nanny that keeps us all doing stuff that is super safe and it wants us to, that actually somebody nefariously harnesses that power to achieve societal control, stroke, military superiority, um, and that actually some country around the world decides to use it in a different way. 
Uh, yes, that, that's what I mean by like AI uses as a weapon. Right. Um, and the, the pen is mightier than the sword. So one of the first places we have to be careful of AI being used is in social media to manipulate public opinion. So the, the reason that uh, Twitter is going to a primarily uh, subscriber-based system um, is because it is dramatically harder to create. It's, it's like, call it 10,000 times harder uh, to create a, an account that has a verified phone number from a credible carrier that has a, a, a credit card and that pays a small amount of money per month um, and have those credit cards and phone numbers be highly distributed, not clustered, is in, in incredibly difficult. Um, so whereas in the past, uh, someone could create a, a million fake accounts for a penny a piece um, and then manipulate, have, have something appear to be very, very much liked by the public when in fact it is not or promoted and retweeted when in fact it is not, this popularity is, is, is not real, and essentially gain the system. So the, the bias towards uh, a, a subscription-based verification, I think, is, is very powerful, and that really you won't be able to trust uh, any social media company that does not do this, uh, because it will simply be overrun with bots to such an extreme, extreme degree. So if we take it back to where we started, if you look at the election that's coming up, how big a role will this big shift in AI capability over the last few months, which will obviously continue through the next year, how big an impact is this gonna play, do you think, in the messaging and the way that people get told um, the different pitches of, of the candidates? I think that's something we need to be on lookout for in, in a big way, is to make sure that this we're minimizing the impact of AI manipulation. Um, we're very, certainly very much taking it, taking that seriously at X, X Twitter, you know, X, X slash Twitter. And, um, and I think we're putting in place all of the protections to um, minimize and certainly detect when we see large scale manipulation of the system. Okay, but beyond Twitter, are you worried about this for the election in general? Uh, yeah. Um, There probably will be attempts to use AI to manipulate the public, um, and some of it will be successful. Um, and if, if not this election, for sure the next one. Okay, I've got two more questions on AI, if you've got the time, and then just a, uh, a little bit on China and Tesla, if that's okay. Um, the first thing is, um, we talk a lot in terms of AI about the next five to 10 years and what the impact is going to be on jobs and some of these things. If you look out on a much longer time frame, given the speed and scale of the change, and you look to your grandkids and great-grandkids, can you just give us a sense of what, what it's going to be like to be human? How, how much is this going to change the fundamental nature of how we operate as, as a race at this point? I think it's going to change a lot. Um, especially if you go f further out into the future. I mean, there will be, everything will be automatic. I mean, there'll, there'll be household robots that you can fully talk to as though there are people um, that can help you around the house or be a companion or whatever the case may be. Uh, there will be humanoid robots throughout, you know, factories. Um, and um, ours will also be all automatic. Um, and, and anything that, that where intelligence, intelligence can be applied, um, even mo modest intelligence, will be automated. Um, say like, so if you say like 10, 20 years from now. And we, will um, we be connected to that technology through a Neuralink type uh, device? Maybe. I mean, is that, is that where this, in, in your view, obviously, is that where this heads? Well, uh, a high bandwidth interface uh, from the cortex to the uh, so your sort of computing or AI tertiary layer, which already exists, uh, to, you know, it's just that we don't have a high bandwidth connection. Um, you know, we've, got, we've got our um, limbic system, which is our sort of foundational element. That's sort of our instincts and desires and whatnot. Uh, then our cortex on, on top of that, which is our, our thinking part of our brain. 
Um, and then we have a tertiary digital layer, which is currently in the form of our phones and computers and laptops and whatnot, and all the applications. Um, and the, the constraint on better, uh, you know, a better merging or, or um, the, the you know the constraint on 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 um, having human interests and machine interests be aligned is the bandwidth, especially the output. So if you say like, at what speed can you output to a computer? It's using voice or your fingers, which move very slowly. So you're talking about maybe ten bits per second or some some fairly small data rate. Um, uh, so with with the neural link, you can increase that by, you know, in, increase that by a million, probably. Um, so everything just speeds up? Speeds up, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, th th this is uh, obviously in a relatively benign scenario, because there's a question of not just, uh, let's say it's a benign scenario. Um, how, how do we even appreciate or understand what the, what the computer is doing. Right. Um, how do we even, how do we go, how do we go along for the ride? Um, and if we have a better, if we have a brain, brain machine interface that's, I don't know, a million times faster, then we're more like, we'll, we'll go along for the ride a lot better. Right. That then if, if we're interfacing with a phone using two slow moving meat sticks. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you put it like that. Um, and, and in terms of, you have a lot of kids, many in this room have kids, you know, what do they need to, what skills do they need to have? What are the three skills that you think are most important for them that you're trying to give them to be prepared and well positioned for this new world? Well, I think it's, a, it's important to have a broad range of, of understanding in, in many different subjects. Uh, so I think general knowledge is important. Um, so you at least have some clue of what you don't know um, in different areas. And then go deep in areas where your child is, has a strong interest and ability. So find, finding that, that overlap of where is my child both interested in this and has some ability to be successful, then uh, you know, finding, if you can find that Venn diagram overlap, then obviously encouraging that is a good thing. Um, and we are obviously headed to a high-tech world, so uh, some basic understanding of computers and software and artificial intelligence is probably a good idea. Okay. But the actual broad thrust of, um, I mean, jobs will change, but it'll be more AI enabling and making it better and easier rather than wholesale, complete change of the skills you need. I mean, it depends on what time frame we're talking about here. So if you say like over 20, 30 year time frame, um, I think things will be transformed beyond belief. Okay. Um, you, won't, you, probably think you'll, you probably won't recognize society in 30 years. Um, like I do think we're, we're fairly close. You asked me about artificial general intelligence. I think we're perhaps only three years, maybe six years away from it, this, this, this decade. Um, so, in fact, arguably we are on the event horizon of the black hole that is artificial superintelligence. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sweet uh, <laughs> So I'm going to ask one final question, and I'm going to see if you've got two minutes to take a couple of questions from the floor. And it's, it comes back to China, which you've talked about a little bit. You have a very big business in China, in Tesla. Um, and obviously, you know, you're on that geopolitical fault line that's getting um, potentially interesting. It, to what extent is this affecting your decision making around sort of how you put assets and, and stuff on the ground? And how concerned are you about that? as a business person, and a lot of people in this room have business in China, about that getting very, very difficult for us? Well, there, there is fundamentally um, an issue that's coming to a head with Taiwan. Um, 
And it's unclear when exactly push will come to shove, but it seems that there's a good chance push will come to shove. It's trending in that direction. Um, I'd read to think what would, what they would happen. The results would be for the global economy would be absolutely catastrophic. Um, but um, you know, China has been very clear about its goals on China and uh, sort of um, including Taiwan um, as, as part of China. So one does not need to read between the lines. One can simply read the lines. They are very clear. Um, and they're not getting. And is the biggest concern, um, despite you know the, the 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 prospect of conflict itself, um, obviously a lot of the world's high-end chips come out of Taiwan. I mean, how catastrophic would that be if that was cut off? Well, there's even more that comes out of China. Um, so China does a lot, so much of, of the world's um, heavy lifting on manufacturing, especially if ma the manufacturing is, you know, simply hard work and, and say not, not particularly glamorous. Um, China just does an immense amount of hard work um, that people, most people have no idea how much hard work they do. So, um, being cut off from Taiwan is much le less, less of a concern than being cut off from, Ta from China. Now, Ta China would reciprocally suffer, of course, um, because uh, I, I would say that the economy of the, the economies of, of, of China and Taiwan are, are they're, they're like conjoined twins with the the Western economy with with the rest of the world. So China, China and the West and the rest of the world being conjoined twins from an economic standpoint will mean that the separation is going to be dire indeed. Okay. If that happens, I hope it does not happen. So, um, and there's no easy solution here, but if there's any, if there's any path to a diplomatic uh, solution, uh, we should really uh, take that seriously. Great. Do you have time to take a few questions from the floor, Elon? Sure. Sure. Does anybody uh, have a question they'd like to pose? We'll go here and then here. Behind you. Thanks, Elon. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm the founder of a real estate business in Newcastle in the northeast of England. Um, we export, manufacture and export more cars from the northeast than the whole of Italy. Uh, would you let me build you a Tesla factory <laughs> in the northeast of England? Uh, no, uh, th thanks for the offer. So I will certainly <laughs> strongly consider uh, England uh, for a future location of, of a gigafactory. Thank you. I'll get you the... So you will, you will consider it? Are you actively considering it? Uh, we, 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 we have, we're not currently uh, looking at new locations, but we will pull it towards the end of this year. I'll send you some plans, OK? okay. Um, uh, Davide, here, please. Thank you for your time. Uh, fusion. Lots of scientists say it could change the world. Planet is the sun. All life on this planet and on Mars depends on fusion, the sun itself. Can I ask you why a man of your brilliant brain, resources, and talent is not actually focusing on fusion, which I think could be a game changer for society, and rather than on Twitter, where there are many media decent companies that can do it, and I would say it almost in a trivial way. Well, I'm, I, I think we already have um, a giant fusion reactor in the sky that called the sun that shows up every day. So, um, which I always said, like, if you want to know what standing in front of a fusion, fusion reactor feels like, just go out, go and stand in, in front of the sun. You know, just walk outside. <laughs> that's, what it, that's what a giant fusion reactor feels like, because that's what the sun is. Um, it converts about four and a half million tons, four and a half million tons of mass to energy every second and requires no maintenance. It's amazing. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to refuel it. You don't have to maintain it. It's just there. Um, so my recommendation for fusion is uh, solar power and uh, batteries. 
Um, and we can easily power all of Earth with uh, just with photovoltaics and batteries. Not, I mean, not easily, but there's just a very clear path to do so. Um, and and uh, no miracles required, just work. Hmm. Interesting. I'm also an advocate of, of wind and of, of nuclear fission, uh, geothermal, hydro, and whatnot. Uh, we'll take a couple more. One here and then the lady at the back. Thank you. As you're considering exposure to China, and particularly um, in the EV space and, and with the battery supply chain, what's your process for evaluating political risk in the near and midterm? I guess I just talked to my team. Re, you know, read the news. Uh, I don't know. Assess assess the opinion on Twitter, I suppose. Um, <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a very deep analysis you can get on Twitter from people that are ex world experts on a particular subject. So, um, I don't know. I think we just we, we try to prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Um, and um, you know, make sure we have factories in uh, geographically diversified uh, regions of the world where uh, the supply chain is as localized as possible. Um, but this is important uh, also for force majeure situations. So if there are uh, earthquakes, wildfires, riots, revolutions, uh, ice storms, uh, heat waves, uh, you name it. Uh, I think I've seen it all at this point. Um, so you want to have you you want, you want to have a supply chain that does not inherit force majeure from all of Earth, um, because something bad is going to happen somewhere. It's a, big, it's a big planet, so so that's why I think it's important to have um, localized supply chains with uh, factories in in many geographies. Uh, last question from the lady at the back. Thank you. Yeah, you famously tweeted that you thought that population collapse was a much bigger risk to humanity than climate change. What do you think states, families, even companies can do to ensure that more of us want to have more children? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's very telling if you look at the birth rates, which are just you know, publicly available. Um, you can look at, uh, say, the birth rate last year for every country, um, it's available online, um, and you can look at the trend in birth rates, and it's just very clear that the trend has been strongly downward, um, and that we've recently hit uh, all-time lows. So um, you'd think if, you know, during COVID, if, you know, what else you got to do? You might as well have a kid. But, um, it didn't happen, actually. We had a big drop in birth rate during, during COVID. Um, we've an increase in divorces, too, since <laughs> well, no, spent a lot of time with their significant other. Um, so but I, I think generally, um, so simply changing people's mind about the, the goodness of having kids, it's like very important to have kids in order to, to continue civilization. Um, and I think sometimes it's viewed as, uh, you know, kids are viewed as an imposition on the world. I, I don't think that's the case at all, or that, that people sometimes think there are too many people in the world. That's, that's certainly not the case. You can, fit, you can fit all of the humans on Earth on one floor in the city of New York. You know, it would be uncomfortable, but, but just to give you a sense of the cross-sectional area of Earth that is human is very tiny. It, it just seems big if you're in, in a big city. Um, but for the vast majority of the Earth, if, if you're given a task of, from, from a plane of dropping a bowling ball and, 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 and you have to hit someone, you'd, you'd miss. I almost never hit anyone. Um, so, uh, the point is that you very rarely go over a, a person, um, in an aircraft, you fly from LA to New York, the vast areas of land with no one at all. So anyway, the, I, th I think we, we want to just generally have it be socially, um, encouraged to have kids. I think, uh, certainly companies need to support, uh, uh, employees that have kids. Um, I think in terms of government incentives, uh, there should be uh, some, I think, tax breaks for having kids, you know, or, or make it just financially not burdensome to have children. Um, 
And, and it's always worth bearing in mind, like aut autonomy aside, um, if someone doesn't have kids, what you're actually asking is that uh, someone else's kids take care of you when you're old. And that, that doesn't seem like quite right, you know? Um, because that, because that's, that's what be for, they'll be forced to do, absent automation, is, is that someone else's kids will have to take care of you when you're old. And, um, you know, so I think, anyway, whatever, one way or another, we need to solve this birth rate issue or civilization will dwindle to nothing. Isn't that where AI comes in? It'll do all the jobs for us. So we can, we can handle a uh, potentially lower population or what you're talking about. I think th there will be robot nannies that are very competent. So that will help. 